Hello and welcome to lesson 64 of the learning guitar series. In this particular lesson we're going to keep discussing uh, the melodic minor scale and we're going to look uh, in the specific uh, to the C minor shape. But also we're going to look uh, more details to the uh, cage system and uh, the logic behind the, the backing track that comes with this lesson. Beside the, the usual PDFs uh, that, uh, you know, that I publish. Before continuing, I'd like to, uh, to uh, thank the Patreons who are supporting this project. It's invaluable. And uh, for those of you who are not, uh, who might be considering supporting this project, I encourage you to do so. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's start discussing. First of all, let me show you the PDF. And what we got here basically is the melodic minor shape of C minor. It's the, the PDF then is split in, in G minor, and here you have all the intervals, second, thirds, um, double stops, etc., all the way to all the way to octaves. When we when we're talking about shape of C minor, what we're uh, what we're looking at is well the usual cage system, but uh, I thought. Um, I get often asked about the cage system. Some people seem to be um, confused, and I get it. I mean, like, sometimes we hear saying, okay, is a C chord in the shape of that, or is a D chord in the shape of X and Y and Z. It can get a little bit confusing, but once you understand the logic of it, it's, it's actually fairly simple. Mm, cage system, I mean, it's, it's kind of a lucky coincidence that the, the word caged spelled C-A-G-E-D. In a way, it can symbolize the fact that we are subdividing the neck of the guitar in area, areas of interest. And also, lucky break, uh, the spelling of cage gives us the five open chords we have on the guitar. So far, so good. So like C, A, G, E, and D. Also, extra lucky break, if we think of the way the neck develops, the, um, the sequence of chords, when we're talking about a single chord. So, what I mean by that is, right now I'll play you five different chords in one area of the neck. I can play you, using the cage system, the same chord in five areas of the neck. And kind of covering the neck up, up around fret 12. And of course, after fret 12, we know that the guitar starts repeating itself. That's basically an octave. So if I take the chord C, this is a C chord in the shape of C. Okay, that's the finger shape we're talking about here. After the letter C in the word cage, that there is the letter A. And in fact, the next C chord, literally, is a C chord in the shape of A, so in the shape of A major transposed. If you think again of the sequence of the word cage, to C, A, G. And in fact, the next shape, it's a C chord in the shape of G. Let's keep going, C, A, G, E. And now in fact, the next C chord, is a C chord in the shape of E, in the shape of E major, transposed obviously. And if I, keep, if I keep going, C, A, G, E, D. And now I have a C chord in the shape of D. So, D major transposed. And I covered the entire guitar, because after the D shape, in this case, we're back to the C shape. And in fact, a guitar has got, you know, in my case, I have eight cages, which is five and then three repeats itself. The same thing happens to matter. By the way, do they all start from C as a shape and they go? No, obviously not. I mean, but the sequence, I'll show you. The sequence is always the same. So if you start from a C shape, you'll have C, A, G, E, D. Maybe you start from a D shape and you'll have D, C, A, G, E. So it's still the word caged, like the sequence of the lettering is still the same. So you can always expect an A shape following a C shape, or you can always expect an E shape following a G shape preceded by an A shape, etc. What I mean, let's take an, you know, let's take a random chord, uh, B flat. If I started the first available B flat on the guitar, it would be here. 
and this is a B flat in the shape of A. So it's an A chord transposed. If you think of the of the word cage, after A, this is G. So I can expect this shape to pop out. And in fact, this is a B flat in the shape of G. After that, you would expect the E shape. And this is in fact a, a B flat the shape of E. After the E shape, you expect the D shape. There you go. After D shape, you are a C shape. That's B flat. And that's five shapes. One, two, three, four, five. And now you're back. And why I think it's a, it's a good system, as you noticed so far, not only to study through it, but also to practice through it, because it's a very good foundation on which then to build, say, the three notes per strings and study wind versions that we've done, etc. Because it's easier with this system to kind of relate scales, arpeggios, and uh, scales, arpeggios, and and chords to know a C shape in you know a C chord in the shape of uh, a G. So it would be this. This is not a chord as as you know fingering voice that we might play for strumming acoustic guitar, etc. But it's an excellent reference for the scales that go with that or with the arpeggios. This instead is much easier stuff to play. And then, you know, there is a bunch of interesting chords that we can get out of that. Which are actually easier to finger than something like this. Um... So why am I pointing this out? As I said, like hopefully it will uh, kind of clear some of the confusion that sometimes comes with the cage system. But as I said, it's kind of predictable, especially in its sequencing. And uh, also makes it easier to kind of build on top of it um, in the long run, including three notes per string and seven shapes, etc. <coughs> if you look at the equivalent minor, and this is the part, you know, this is really what you need as a starting point. The equivalent minor would be, okay, we know E minor, obviously we have an open chord for that, we know A minor, we have an open chord for that, and we have a D minor, and we have an open chord for that. <coughs> C minor and G minor, we don't really have an open chord, so we tend to, you know, break down the amount of strings that we're using, so, so to me, this is C minor. So what happens, basically, a major chord, in the case of C major, the third, which is basically what gives us a major, is the E note, which I have on the 6th string, 4th string, and top string. If, if I lower the third, I find myself playing this on the middle 4 strings, and of course I cannot play the top and bottom strings, because I would have to kind of tune them down to E flat. But again, this might not be a chord that I might, I might use when there is a C minor on the chart. Probably this is more comfortable, you know. But this is a reference. And by the way, two ways of visualizing a, a C minor, either with the C in the bass, not very comfortable, but you can use the middle four strings. This is mainly for visualization purposes. Or by not playing the root and actually putting a G on top, which is how you will find it in the in the PDF I'm about to show you. In the other case, it's a G minor, where again we break it down to literally four string. Here is my root note and the bottom three strings, which is basically the equivalent of this chord minus these two fingers, because we're kind of looking at it from this perspective. And that's it, so the same consideration applies. So this is C minor, shape of C. In the word caged, the shape of C is followed by the letter A. So in fact, this is C minor, shape of A. And in fact, you can see the A minor transposed. After the shape of A, caged, so I have the shape of G. That's the one. Sometimes I like to play it this way. Gives me more a sense of that's the area, or that's the cage I'm involved in. After the shape of G, of course, the shape of E. Here you go. After the shape of E, it's the shape of D. And in fact, this is C minor. <coughs> 
which brings us to a, 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 an interesting discussion about the backing track that I created for this lesson and uh, why uh, the, the, the chord sequence is uh, defined as it is. Um, by the way, the backing track is on YouTube and of course like it's on the Patreon page where you can also, the patrons can also download the MP3s, etc. The score sequence is E flat minor, uh, eight bars of it, going into uh, G minor, going into A minor. And I specifically, specifically uh, choose those chords because it allows us to practice um, this progression trying to stay in the same area. So using three different scales and trying to negotiate the, the going from one to the other without moving too much across the neck. If you remember in lesson 63, instead we worked on moving across the neck, up and down. In this case, E flat minor, I'm suggesting the shape of C, so this allows us to, to practice the content of uh, this lesson. And in the case of E flat, shape of C is here. Or, and the melodic minor that goes with that is... When we go to uh, G minor, now G minor I'm suggesting to use the shape of D minor. And basically this would be the chord. And to use the melodic minor, so this was basically what we studied in lesson 63. And for A minor, I'm suggesting to use um, the shape of E. So basically we're looking at this chord now, and the melodic minor that goes with that is what we studied in lesson 62. I think you can see where I'm going with this. So in other words, I picked up three chords that allows us to practice what we've done in lesson 64, what we've done in lesson 63 and 62, while simultaneously trying to stay in the same area of the neck. So we're going from this chord, to this chord, to this chord, and it just uh, keeps looping. As, as I mentioned before, obviously, when we're looking at a minor chord now, with the knowledge they accumulated so far, we also get to realize that now we have options. So over a minor chord, in this case E flat is the first chord that we looked at, in the shape of C, here is our uh, Dorian scale, here is our melodic minor scale, and here is our pentatonic scale, and you can see how the chord, this is the shape of C minor, it's highlighted in blue. You can see how, you know, the difference between Dorian and melodic minor is literally the flat 7 in Dorian, and the major 7 in melodic minor. The rest, we have 1 flat 3 5, that tells us that that's a scale that applies to a minor chord. So we can get different sounds depending if we're using Dorian, melodic minor, or pentatonic. And as we scroll down, here is the equivalent for G minor in the shape of D. Here is the shape of D, of course played at fret 5, this is a G minor. Here is the Dorian, as you would expect, the flat 7 is going to become a major 7 for melodic minor, the rest of the scale is in common. And then you have the pentatonic shape. It's all contained. Oh, sorry about the four, this, this four should not be blue. Apologize, apologies for that. Last but not least, A minor, shape of E minor, and you can see clearly the chord, the other shape. Dorian, once again, the minor seven becomes a major seven, and here is the, the minor pentatonic shape, which is probably like the you know, the shape that uh, most people are familiar with. The difference of sound is kind of obvious. Obviously, I'm, uh, I'm going to play you an E-flat minor. If I, if I use the pentatonic on top of it, obviously, you know, it's going to sound rather bluesy, no? If I use Dorian, obviously it's gonna, you know, Dorian has got his own character and 
in sound. And and uh, now you can hear what the major seven is going to do the moment I apply melodic minor. So the major seven is replacing the flat seven. So the moment you start applying these kind of differences and <clears throat> different scale, of course you get a different vibe. Over the over the progression that we studied, um, if uh, if you were to play just pentatonics, I'm gonna play without a backing track, but. You can kind of hear, even if I'm not using arpeggios right now, but just, you know, fragments of pentatonic scales, you can kind of hear a little bit the chord changing. And again, because we're treating every single chord as not part of a specific uh, general key, we're not thinking diatonically, we're still, we're literally thinking every chord has got a life on its own. And in this case, we have the option of three scale per chord that we can use while kind of staying in the same area of the neck. We're looking at an area of the neck that goes roughly from here to here for all those three chords. And that's the point, you know, trying to phrase, trying to phrase a, a cross. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Maybe I'll just use um, a loop, a smaller progression. I will loop maybe like a, just a E flat going into G minor. But the point is, instead of trying to play a phrase over E flat, a phrase over G minor, and a phrase over E flat, so like da, 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 da. Trying to play phrases which kind of comes across the bar. So maybe a phrase starts in E flat and continues over G minor. Then maybe starts in G minor and continues over E flat. Because it, it's, you know, it's sometimes it can be very melodic, you know, in a way to play the changes as opposed to here is a line, here is a line, here is a line. I'll show you what I mean. I hope it makes sense, but you see what I mean by like starting a phrase on a chord and then continue the continue the phrase into the next chord. 
Same thing is what you want to try and do with the backing track. As usual, you want to spend, you know, half the time studying uh, the intervals because you'll really get familiar with the scale. And of course, if you've done 63, less than 63 and 62, you should be, you should be familiar with the three shape and this progression kind of includes them all. Um, that's the ratio behind it. And having eight bars gives you enough time to work on each, on each shape. As usual, you want to spend half the time on whatever practice regime you have. Half the time, you want to spend it uh, studying things, so develop your muscle memory, photographic memory of things. And uh, half the time, you definitely want to spend it just playing, you know. Of course, in this case, I'm giving you some limitation, but in, you know, the back and track is like 10 minutes long. If you play it three times a day, that's already like half an hour of practice. That's why I'm making so long, right? And um, at some point you can break free. You should know by now five shapes of pentatonics. So, so you kind of should already be co able to cover the entire, the entire neck. So you can, you know, for E flat, feel free to go up and down on using pentatonics and then move into G minor pentatonics, five shapes, move into A minor pentatonic five shapes. You can still play five shapes. And as I demonstrated in lesson 62, you can always do using two shapes of melodic minor, still negotiate the entire neck. I say at the same time in this particular, uh, with this particular back and track and with this particular lesson, I wanted to kind of force you a little bit to think, to see the chords, visualize the chords. So to visualize, okay, it's E flat, going into G minor, going to A, is everything kind of nearby. And to move when you're soloing, to move <coughs> in small increments across the neck as opposed to jumping, okay? I hope it makes sense, and as, as always, you know, if you're a patron and you have any questions, just uh, just uh, write to me on Patreon, and you know, I'll be happy to answer them. And um, for those of you who subscribe to, to the YouTube channel, thank you for that, obviously. Um, and feel free to post questions or message me questions if you feel like. Um, it's been a pleasure as always, and uh, until next time, bye.